Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, we've just heard that we're going to talk about these OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which were updated in 2011. And it's an indication of just how fast everything has moved, that we did not talk about the gig economy or the platform economy or platform workers at the time of the 2011 update. So things have moved fast. But I still think, and it's a question for you as well as we're going through the presentation, all of you, um, whether or not the framework covers the platform economy. I want, I want you to keep that in mind. So just so, just so I know, who knows, who knows the OECD guidelines for multinationals? Who's heard, who's, who's heard of them? Has anybody used them? Anybody filed a case? Hooray. Okay, some people have used them. And who is familiar with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights? Okay, and this concept of human rights due diligence. Okay, so so this is new for, for some people in the room, so we can we can we can take it slowly. The OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which were last updated in two thousand and eleven, are non binding recommendations on business conduct. And they're made by governments to companies. So they're not the same as a code of conduct, which companies draw up. We've just been talking about standards and private standards. This isn't a private standard. This is an international recognized standard. It's drawn up by governments. There are 48 governments that have signed these guidelines, and they apply to all their multinationals operating in those countries or from those countries. The guidelines say as a baseline responsibility of companies is that they should avoid and address their adverse impacts. The colleague has already um, referred to that in the presentation on the GRI. So this is the baseline responsibility of companies, that they are responsible for their adverse impacts, their negative impacts. And I think this is really going to help. At the, be at the beginning this morning, um, a colleague said we're trying to talk about two different things, the responsibility in supply chains and the responsibility of, in the platform economy. And I think this concept that companies are responsible for their adverse impacts helps us on both of those things. And I think that's something we can, we can think about together. So if companies are responsible for their adverse impacts, then it doesn't matter where those impacts occur. It's not just in, the, in their own operations, because it's the impacts that have got to do with their products and services. So it's in the supply chain. It's in their joint ventures. It's in other business relationships. And I would argue that it's in the platform economy. So one, the guidelines establish a responsibility for companies to address their negative impacts wherever they occur, so not just in the company's own operations. But two, this means that they cover the impacts on all kinds of workers. So we heard earlier about this argument about whether it's an, the standards apply to employees or we need to change the definition of an employee to a worker. We've already done that in the guidelines. We got the wording worker. And companies are responsible for adverse impacts on workers, whether they're employees, whether they're on precarious contracts, and again, I would argue whether they're working in the gig economy or the platform economy. And so it's very far-reaching, this responsibility, because if you're responsible for your adverse impacts wherever they occur, it doesn't matter if it's five tiers down the supply chain or if it's somebody who's delivering your pizza. It's your pizza, and you're responsible for those adverse impacts. So I think it's, it's, it's far-reaching responsibility that we have here under the OECD guidelines, but also under the UN guiding principles. The guidelines also say that, sorry, I'm looking at my slides. If, if, sorry, if you go back up, 
I'm still on the summary slide. One up. Yeah. So the guidelines also say that companies should undertake something called due diligence. So if companies, they're not, companies are not supposed to violate workers' rights. They have to have a process in place called due diligence in order to make sure that there are no violations of workers' rights, for example. We're going to come on to that. And then very importantly for the trade union movement, the guidelines have a complaints mechanism and trade unions and NGOs are able to file complaints against multinational enterprises for violations of the guidelines, whether in their own operations or their supply chain. And uh, the trade union movement have used those guidelines exactly to do that. Now, if we go on to the next slide. The reason I'm putting this up, I, I don't know if everyone can see it, it it's, this is the framework which engages the responsibility of a company. And for those of you working on the platform economy, I, th I think it's interesting to think about this. The responsibility is engaged in three different ways under these guidelines. A company can cause an adverse impact. So if you cause an adverse impact, it's in your factory. It's in your own operations. You're causing it. You're responsible for it. You've got to stop it. And indeed, you've got to remedy any, um, any um, impacts that actually occur, negative impacts. So that's what we know about. That's straightforward, the responsibility of the company. It was always responsible for what happened within the factory gates, if you like. The second way is that the company's responsibility is engaged if it contributes to an adverse impact. Now you can imagine this is in the supply chain where a company, a multinational is not the only actor. There's other brands that are sourcing from the factory. There's the factory itself. So it's not the only one that's causing, but it's contributing to those adverse impacts. And finally, responsibility is engaged where a company is only linked to adverse impacts. It's, it hasn't caused, it hasn't contributed. Perhaps it's an investor in a company. It might only have a 1% shareholding. It hasn't caused those, those anti-union um, practices. It's not contributing to them, but it's still investing in that company. And so under the guidelines, it still has a responsibility. So if you think about the platform economy, we have these three levels of responsibility, cause, contribute, and being directly linked. And I would argue just, I'm no expert on the platform economy, but from what I've been hearing today, that indeed, sometimes it's cause, and other times it may be contribute. That it's that kind of responsibility that we're looking at in, in relation to the platform economy. But in the supply chain, indeed, we're in, normally in a sort of contribution relationship. So if we, if we go on to the next slide, we'll, we'll come back to this at, at the end as we go to the next slide. So the guidelines are the most comprehensive international standard for responsible business conduct. And these are the chapters of the guidelines. We're not going to go into them all, but the ones in red are the ones that the trade union movement uses the most. So we've talked a lot earlier about the disclosure of information. There's a whole chapter in the OECD guidelines on information disclosure. There's a chapter on human rights. That's a new chapter from in 2011. And there's what we consider our chapter on employment and industrial relations. And just to give you the next slide, just to give you an idea of what's in these guidelines, there's lots of recommendations that are very useful for trade unions. So companies should respect the right of workers to form or join trade unions. That's in chapter five. They should respect the right of workers to have trade unions recognized for the purposes of collective bargaining. That's also in chapter five. Respect human rights. There's a new chapter four, which says that companies should respect human rights. And there's a dedicated chapter on the disclosure of information in chapter three. And we've just been hearing about information and participation consultation um, from, the, from the ETUC. And some, there's a number of provisions in chapter three and chapter five, which relate to that, which is extremely important for trade unions and trade unions are using those 
um, recommendations. And finally, there's this recommendation that companies undertake due diligence. So, since 2000, and I don't know if you think this is a lot or this is very few, but since 2000, so trade unions have filed 192 cases. So it's one a month for the global trade union movement. The NGOs have filed more, they filed about 250. So it's not a huge number of cases, um, but it's kind of steady. And mainly the cases have concerned the victimization of union leaders, union members, refusal to recognize trade unions for the purposes of collective bargaining, threats to relocate production, when because of trade union organizing failure again we were hearing about this earlier failure to consult with trade unions on um, restructuring or any other changes that have major employment effects abusive use of precarious workers trade unions have used the guidelines in cases of um, abusive precarious work contracts failures to provide information and failures to conduct due diligence so that's how it will, at the end we'll just look at some cases. So I'm going to explain what due diligence is, but I, I thought we could start just but if everybody thinks of, of what the answer to this, these questions are. I mean, generally, do companies state that they respect human rights? Do you ever go to a company website and they say, no, we don't? respect human rights. I mean, generally, and I don't know about some of these platform companies, maybe they don't, but generally when you go and look at company websites, they say we respect human rights, yeah? Well, what do they do to know that they respect human rights? How do they know that they respect human rights? So that's what due diligence is. Due diligence says under international, it doesn't say, under international standards, companies have to respect human rights. And if they're to respect human rights, they need to have a process. And that process is called due diligence. Next slide. So companies are responsible for respecting human rights, avoiding their negative impacts. They have to have a process in place to do that. And it's the process by which they would be able to know and they'd be able to show that they respect human rights. And that means, first of all, prevention. You're supposed to avoid violating rights. You're not supposed to violate the rights and then do something about it. So number one is prevent. Number two is where you have violated rights, you're supposed to take action to stop it and then you're supposed to provide remedy. So that's what a due diligence process is. Now, the OECD has been charged, next, the next slide. The OECD has been charged um, with developing due diligence guidance for a number of sectors. And I'm just going to look at the sector on garment and footwear because it's the same principles for all the other sector guidance. So this is what a due diligence process is made up of. And due diligence, it's important to emphasize, is carried out in a company's own operations, but also in the supply chains and other business relationships. So the first step is that they have to embed their if they're going to respect human rights, if they're going to respect these OECD guidelines, they have to embed that commitment. And that means having a policy and having management systems. We've heard about management systems already, but you need to have a policy and you need to have management systems. Because otherwise, what is that commitment? There's no embedding in the company. The second is they have to identify their actual impacts and potential impacts. Once they've identified them, they need to address any actual impacts. They need to track performance. They need to communicate. We've just been talking about confidentiality, but under due diligence, they need to communicate on what they're doing. And they need to remedy. So you'll get these slides, but those are the basic components of a due diligence process.
And when you do due diligence, you have to do it against something. What, what in it? So this is the garment supply chain. Next slide. Sorry. This is the garment supply chain. So with unions and companies sat down in a room together at the OECD and they said, we already know what the adverse impacts are. What, what are the risks that are likely to occur in our supply chain? We know we have a problem with child labor. We know that trade union rights are violated. We know we've got problems with home workers and hazardous chemicals. So they came up with this list. And any company in the garment sector has to do its due diligence, having policies, identifying the adverse impacts and working to address them and remedying them against, as a starting point, against these risks. So why should trade unions be concerned about due diligence? Next, the next slide. And there's two reasons. So if, if you don't take anything else away from this presentation today, this, this is really the crux. The first is that companies have a role in doing due diligence. If you go to see a company and talk to it about its due diligence, and you know now that it has to identify and address its adverse impacts, how is that company going to identify and address adverse impacts on workers? if it doesn't speak to unions. So that's number one. Trade unions have a role in this due diligence. And number two, as you saw in the garment sector risks, they have to do due diligence on trade union rights. So in their supply chain, if there are no, they need to have a policy that says they won't tolerate anti-union behavior. And they need to do investigations where there are no unions in order to understand what's going on. And they need to look at the impact on trade union rights of precarious contracts. So if we just go on to the, so the trade, the first one, the trade union role in due diligence. The OECD has said in its guidance that agreements between trade unions and employers are a form of due diligence, so whether it's a collective bargaining agreement, a global framework agreement, or a sector agreement. We worked very hard to make sure that was in the OECD a, a, um, formal guidance on this, and it is, we have it. So this is the role in due diligence. Next slide. And then they also have to conduct, just as they have to look for child labor or they have to look at adverse environmental impacts, they have to look at what the impacts are on trade union rights. And they need to have policies that say they don't tolerate anti-union behavior. They need to look at the intimidation of workers and their supply chain refusals to recognize or to bargain in good faith effects of short-term contracts. This is all in the OECD guidance. Next slide. And again, so that's for identifying impacts. And here, if you're going to prevent them, they need to use their leverage with suppliers. And that can include suspending orders or collaborating with other brands in order to address those, in, in order to increase what they call their leverage and address those impacts, or even disengaging. I mean, we've seen that in the Bangladesh Accord. So trade unions have a role in due diligence and companies, along with all the other rights that they have to look at, they have to look at their impacts on trade union rights. So why is, why is due diligence different? It's because we've moved we're not talking about operations or first tier or second tier. It's, it's about companies identifying and addressing adverse impacts, wherever those impacts occur. And importantly, due diligence has to be done with stakeholders. And trade unions are stakeholders. They're representatives of affected um, workers. Next slide. So I think that pretty much says what I just said. You, the point of due diligence is not to have a process as an as a end in itself. It's it's a means to an end. It's a means to address any advert, identify 
avoid and address any adverse impacts. It requires stakeholder engagement and it also requires remedy. Next slide. So I'm just going to finish here with some examples. Trade unions have used the guidelines in their um, work. So this is an example of a subsidiary of Unilever where a case was brought against a factory in Pakistan for abusive use of temporary contracts. The factory had 22 permanent employees and 723 precarious workers. And the IUS was able to bring a case and to get an agreement, which included changing the employment model and creating 200 permanent jobs. So that's with subsidiaries. And we kind of always knew that, that we could bring cases against subsidiaries. But now, under this new guidelines, the companies are responsible for their adverse impacts, um, wherever they are. Yeah. Um, so this was a case that actually it was NGOs um, brought against Rana, um, the, the, it was Rana Plaza, the Danish uh, PWT group, for its involvement in Rana Plaza. And there, the, the, the violation of the guidelines was its failure to conduct due diligence. So here we see these new concepts coming in, that you can apply the guidelines to the failure of a multinational to, not, to have conducted due diligence to avoid accidents in the supply chain. So that's, we're seeing we've gone from subsidiaries to supply chains, and then the next, the next slide. Investors. There was a case in Norway which was filed against the Norwegian Investment Bank, which manages the oil fund, for a 0.7% shareholding in a Korea, Korean company that was violating rights in India. So this is, the reach is extremely long. And again, the, the national contact point here said there were violations of the guidelines and it was a failure of due diligence. So if you go back to that framework that I presented at the beginning, MBIM with its 0.7% shareholding, it didn't cause those violations in India and it didn't contribute to them. But nonetheless, it's investing in a company that's violating rights and it has a responsibility. And that was what was found with the case. That was a, a landmark case. And the recommendation was that it needed, because what MBIM did, which is I bet many companies you deal with, it cherry picked its rights. So it was doing lots on forced labor, it was doing lots on child labor, it was doing nothing on other kind of rights. So this was an important landmark case. And again, just showing the reach, we've gone from subsidiaries to suppliers, now to investors. And just the last slide, FIFA. So BWI, the International Union for um, Building Construction Workers, Woodworkers, filed a case against FIFA for violations, for failures of due diligence in relation to the building of the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, and the violations of the migrant, of the rights of the migrant workers. So, and the next one, I'm just aware of time, if you skip, if we go on to the next one and the next one. So just using, if we go one up, using the, one back, one back, that's it. So using the OECD guidelines, there's opportunities to file cases against subsidiaries, but subsidiaries, it can still be precarious workers inside those subsidiaries, suppliers, franchises, business relationships. I also think there's an opportunity under the in the new uh, sharing or platform economy, and also to target investors, even where I mean, they always are minority shareholders. And the next slide, using due diligence, companies should enter into agreements with trade unions to identify and address their adverse impacts on workers' rights. How else are they going to do that? So there's a role there for trade unions. Governments in France, they've brought in legislation making due diligence mandatory. Germany, they're beginning to monitor what they've brought in. They're 
started a plan to monitor what due diligence is. This is this is government action that's required. And of course, investors are linked to these their adverse impacts. So you can always go to investors to get them to use their leverage. But I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.